Good evening and welcome to this Q&A drought special. I'm Hamish McDonald. We've had an overwhelming response to this special with questions coming in from right across our drought affected regions tonight. We spent $8 billion on dams. We had fresh, beautiful water. And we've been in severe drought for two years now. Now we will try to get to as many questions as possible tonight and here in the studio we also have students, farmers and teachers who've travelled uh, many hundreds of kilometres tonight to have their say. Answering the questions from you, the Australia Institute Senior Water Researcher, Marianne Slattery. The Minister for Water Resources, Drought and Natural Disaster, David Littleproud. Kate McBride, the 21-year-old grazier from Menindi, who put the spotlight on thousands of fish deaths in the Darling River. Also, the President of the National Farmers Federation, Fiona Simpson, and the Shadow Minister for Agriculture, Joel Fitzgibbon. Would you please welcome all of them to this very important conversation? The Q&A is live in Eastern Australia on ABC TV and iview and, of course, on News Radio as well. Our first question tonight comes from Drew Bowie. Hi, my question's for Katie McBride. You and your family have worked hard to highlight the damage done to our rivers through mismanagement and the effects of the cotton industry. Do you feel that the government's response has been adequate? Kate, the combination of that and the drought, are you satisfied with what the government is doing? Absolutely not. And something that we need to make very clear tonight is the fact that our water issues are, um, I guess, a little bit caused by drought, but the main issues are not that. And I'll touch on that a little bit later on the program. But we do not feel like we've been heard enough. Um, you know, there is people leaving the land out our way, um, millions of fish dying. And yet it was only after videos went viral um, that we put up that we had anyone come out and visit us. And I think that's really disappointing. Why do people feel like they're not being heard? Because we've been inundated with the questions over the weekend. Uh, it's still people trying to get their voices heard. It's amazing to see that everyday Australians are now talking about it and that's something that's been really heartwarming out our way, but I think it's... The issues haven't been addressed. Like, even when we do get water back in the system, the same thing's going to happen again, and we're really conscious of that. We had a dry river back in 2016, we got water back, and then two years down the track, we are in the same position. So the actual causes of what's going on haven't been addressed, and that's what people are really angry about. All right, we are going to come to the government tonight for a response, but there are plenty of farmers here, plenty of whom want to have a say this evening. So our next question comes from Marie Knight. I'm from just south of Coonabarabin and I've been running a drought relief program called Lamb Jumpers. So I'm living this drought. Australian farmers are the best in the world. Our products are clean, safe, sustainable. Our agricultural industry, one of our greatest assets. So can we stop playing politics and actually get some physical health, um, help from the government onto farms and help farmers. What is it that you want on the farm? What do you actually need? You've got the minister here tonight. What are you asking for? Uh, David, um, Joel, come out and help me feed. Um, you know, the average age of farmers is 66 and we're working 14, 16 hours a day to try... You know, it's physically exhausting. We are physically, mentally, emotionally and financially exhausted. It, we're going into four years of this. We've never seen it. My family's been there for 160 years. We've, we know it's never been this bad. We, we're losing the game. We need help and we need help that goes into the future. Are you considering one of these exit packages? No. We're just feeding stock. We don't have time to do that. We just have to keep animals alive. David Littleproud, how do you respond? Well, look, um, as somebody that's lived this in my own electorate for year eight we're going into, even before I became uh, the member for Maranoa, I, as the candidate, went and did a feed run with a lady called Kate up near Aramac. Uh, and she talked about uh, how her husband uh, was working away in Chinchilla uh, and she hadn't seen him for six months. Uh, but that was the adversity they were faced up to. But they still believed in agriculture. And the reality is we are working together and uh, we're trying to work with the opposition and states as best we can. Uh, this is above politics. And, and let me make, make it clear, our response has escalated. 
Treating drought is like going up a set of stairs. As it escalates, you take another step up. And eight years ago, I've got to say, in a bipartisan way, the Labor Party had a, had a mechanism that has now become the Farm Household Allowance, which is putting money into farmers' pockets. That was, that was there under the Labor Party, and I thank them for that. But we built on that. Our first pillar was around that, putting money in their, in their pockets, giving loans where tens of thousands of dollars go back into farmers' pockets. And then the second stage and the second pillar is around the community, because this, far, this drought goes beyond the farm gate. It goes into the, into the local economies. And we've got to stimulate those in a way that gives them a crack at it as well. And that's why we put money into the shires, a million dollars, and also uh, through uh, building dog fencing, uh, getting also uh, water infrastructure on farm. And then it is about the future. I think you articulate it quite well. We're the first government that has said, let's not just try and look after here and the now. Uh, the next drought starts the first day after we get rain. And we have to prepare for that. And the future fund that we put in place to make sure we give a dividend to give you the, the tools from the research and development, but also the water infrastructure. We announced a couple of dams down in New South Wales and we'll partner with any state. And this is above politics. We can work together uh, and work with NFF. Uh, and we've respectfully listened to them and we'll continue to look what they've put and add to our drought strategy. And that's what we've said from the start. We've continued to evolve as the droughts evolved and that's what we'll continue to do. The Prime Minister said that even farm household assistance those that come off it after four years, they will continue to stay on, on, under the supplementary payments until this drought is over. Uh, but we respect the review and we respect the work that NFF's done and we're here to work collaboratively with everybody. Joel Fitzgibbon, do you think your side of politics is guilty of playing politics with this? Well, Murray, I'm not a farmer, but I spend a lot of time with farmers and I, I spent the October long weekend uh, on a dairy farm and I found the experience very confronting. So. I can't fully appreciate the extent of your pain, but I, I hope or like to think I, I understand it. Uh, this is a very, very serious drought and it requires a very, very serious response. Now, bipartisanship is important and, and, and I've reached out on many occasions, as David has indicated, but there's a really fine line between um, um, being too compliant or, or too, too, too much agreement with the government and our role as an opposition but, but to, keep, to hold the government... you on how long the farm household allowance should okay, extend for. But, but holding the government to account... Our role is to hold the government to account. So we've extended the bipartisan hand, but when, when the government has it wrong, it's my job to call it out. And sadly, David, I think that your government has it terribly wrong. There is no overarching strategic plan for this drought. All the announcements have been ad hoc and piecemeal, one at a time, an announcement here, an announcement there. Uh, we need a battle plan uh, for the nation and we need a scenarios document which tells us what we should do if this drought, God forbid, lasts for another year, or worse, two years, or three years, and each scenario should have a battle plan attached to it so that we can well in advance know what needs to be done. And you're right, Hamie, sadly the government's taking farmers off the farm household allowance while this drought is ongoing, and, and I think that's a very bad decision and very disappointing. Fiona Simpson, you must see the way the politicians are fighting this out. I mean, it's hard to deny that this has become political. Well, I mean, and that's the worst scenario for communities and landholders and anybody suffering drought, to be honest. I mean, so on my does own... does it anger you? Um, I think people just get really frustrated. I mean, they see the outcomes, they see the needs out there in the communities, and the last thing they want is political uh, machinations getting in the way of some really good outcomes. But that's exactly what's happening, isn't it? Well, it is and it isn't. I mean, I think that, that at the moment what we need, we do need to get everybody in the room. And the NFF's proposed that um, some of the things that we've proposed for future droughts actually come into play now, and that is that we have state governments in the room, we have federal governments in the room, we have people who represent farmers and communities in the room so that we can actually focus on the outcomes, Hamish, <coughs> rather than, you know, this mudslinging that happens in, in Parliament sometimes when people get distracted by what side of the, 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 um, the house they sit on rather ask, than the outcomes. Don't you need to ask why this is happening so many years into the drought? Absolutely. And, look, this government is the first government that's actually even contemplated having a policy that uh, where we're looking at future droughts instead of just playing catch-up and looking and being reactive. And so, you know, and I, I congratulate the government for what they've, they've put out there so far, but we need more. And as David said, we do have to keep looking at the... Uh, and responding. But we do need to have another plan in place too because we can't keep going into the next drought like, we, like we've dealt with this drought. And that's one of the, the critical things. I mean, Marie's right. I live down the road from her. The need is absolutely critical out there at the moment. But we have no um, plan. We don't really know. We're in uncharted waters. 
And because the farming industry is so diverse and communities are so diverse and the needs are so diverse, then and, and we haven't got the data about what's worked in the past, um, we haven't got the assessments and the rigour around those decisions, then it's really, really hard. Marianne Slattery, can I bring you in for some expertise? I mean, your focus is water research. But do you think politics uh, has failed to grasp the enormity of the challenge facing Australia right now? Um, I, I think that the, the politics is... Um, both sides of politics, major sides of politics, are really, um, in, really invested in making sure that the Murray-Darling Basin Plan continues in its current form and aren't willing to actually have a look at what's gone wrong with that plan and have a conversation about, you know, what has worked and what hasn't worked and what do we need to change. And I think that in this, in this conversation about a drought policy, what I um, don't see is the water reforms have been a structural adjustment by stealth. We are seeing, you know, we've had $13 billion come in into the uh, Murray-Darling Basin Plan. That's attracted a lot of, you know, big agribusiness. Um, it's, it's attracted a lot of, you know, people, the investment from overseas. We're seeing a lot of money that's being shifted to big agribusiness at the expense of family farms. We're seeing the um, creation of industrialised monocultures in our irrigated sections in, in the south. That's going to be nuts. <laughs> And that's pushing all of the family farmers out. So is, is that to, making sorry, it... I have to interrupt there, though, Hamish, because that's, there's some really big sweeping statements in there and they're just not true. What's not true? Well, for example, uh, pushing all the family farmers out. I mean, over well over 95% of farmers in Australia are still family farms. There are big the, the... water speculators, though in business right now that are making huge profits from water? Well, again, we just have to be careful about using the data to make sure that we understand who's in there, who's out. We've got the ACCC looking at the market at the moment. The water market in Australia is new. What she just said that's wrong? Well, so I think there's a premise there that the drought is mostly about the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. And there's plenty of communities that have run out of water, communities like Tenerfield, like Gyra, um, like far, far, far north Queensland, like South Australia. There's plenty of places where the plan is not even in action. There's it's outside the basin. Um, and, you know, I think that we have to talk about drought firstly and then we talk about all the peripheral policies and things that happen with it. But there's no doubt that there is drought, widespread drought across wide parts of Australia at the moment. And, you know, it's really arguable that, that you know, every time we talk about drought then to talk about the Murray-Darling Basin Plan so as well, it doesn't Katie, necessarily comply. Is water a peripheral policy when it comes to dealing with drought? Look, I think water's got to be an integral part of when we're having this drought conversation. But in all honesty, I've spent the last week going around and speaking to people and saying, what are your thoughts on drought? How, what can we do to fix this? What are the issues with it? And even with that, I've had people come up to me and say that they feel like drought packages are focused on big people, big corporate um, people, and that there's this idea that you get big or get out sort of thing. And that's the genuine feeling that I've had speaking to people from the last week. And so even with drought, not, not even like, you know, talking about water, but it's the same, I believe, I agree with you, it's the same case. But even with drought, there's a feeling from people saying, you know, if you're not big enough, then get out. And it's the cool. same with Barnaby Joyce coming in. I'm going to come back to the Minister, but I want to take another question from our audience about the impact this is having on broader regional communities. John Southern is the principal of Trundle Central School in drought-ravaged central New South Wales. Last Friday, the Deputy Prime Minister, Mr McCormack, visited Trundle Central School. During a question and answer session, a Year 3 boy from a long-term farming family asked, is there anybody outside Trundle that really cares about us? Children are often brutally honest and reflect the views of adults. In my community, I certainly believe this young man reflects the views of hundreds of disillusioned people in regards to the speed and targeting of the response to help people, especially children. My question is, why is this nation still so appallingly unprepared for drought? Before I turn to the panel, can you just tell us a bit more about the impact this is having on Trundle and, and your community? Well, my, my kids are, are living a, a crisis situation every day. Like, I've, I've got kids that are going, going out to their farms and... They don't, they don't know what Dad's going to do tomorrow. They don't know whether they're going to be there next week. They don't know whether somebody's going to foreclose on their farm. I've got kids that are generational farmers that are saying to me, they're going, Southo, it's too tough. I don't want to go on this farm anymore, OK? And then I've got people telling me that they're doing all this stuff to help 
my community and my my kids out. And I've got to say, mate, I haven't seen what you're telling me that's happening out there. I haven't seen the grassroots stuff to come and grab my kids and pull them up and say, it's okay. Mm. We're going to get through this. Who's saying that to us? Is that what you want to hear from the minister tonight? I want, pe I, I want people in government out there on the farms patting these kids on the back, patting farmers on the back and saying, it's OK, you are genuinely good Australians that are helping us in, in our economy and they're helping us in our culture. That's, that's what I want. That's what I want from, from, from you guys. David Littleproud. Well, they aren't alone. Uh, let me make that clear. We are standing shoulder to shoulder. Mm -hmm. And as I've said, my electorate's been in this for eight years. Uh, and I've seen the pain and distress on those communities and those children. And we've made sure, particularly around mental health, that it's not just targeted at mum and dad, it's also to the kids. Uh, I had a, a principal in my own electorate tell me that one of their senior students, quite gifted, uh, was away from school for a couple of weeks helping on the land, on their property, because they simply needed the extra set of hands. Uh, that we've got to stop. And we've got to tell them that it's OK, we're going to be there to support them. Our, our mechanism in going towards uh, making a difference to those, those farmers and communities is, as it always is in this country, we have a safety net. A safety net for those you use your own resources and then we get to the point. And that's where uh, it's not correct to say people are being kicked off the farm household allowance. No one will be. And even the Prime Minister's made that clear. In fact, there'll be more people go on it because we've made it easier uh, for those to earn off-farm income to get on it, uh, to give you a little, little bit of an extra helping hand. Uh, that's just one of the mechanisms. And this is the hard thing. Drought is different to other natural disasters because you can rebuild a bridge or a house and you can see it happen. Droughts deplete landscapes and bank balances and it starts at the farm gate and then it spreads through the economies. And so as it continues to worsen, you've got to, you've got to continue to take that next step and try and target into those communities and try and make, it, make a difference by, by stimulating it. And that's what we've tried to do and that's the best way to try and ensure the communities get through as well as those on the land. And there is a future. Make no mistake, we are seeing, we have seen the fifth consecutive year of median land prices, dollars per hectare of, of land, agricultural land, go up. In fact, last year, in 2018, it went up 10.7%. So there is a future in agriculture. The story of agriculture is just add rain. And we can't beat ourselves up because we have, we have been through this before. And let me tell you, we'll be through it again. But that's why we've got, to, as Fiona's quite clearly articulated, we've tried to say, let's not just try and get you through, but make sure you're prepared even better for the next one. Kate... Can I ask you a question? Yeah. When they used to drive through puddles, are you blokes going to leave us, leave us alone? Is that going to be it? Or is it going to be the two or three, four years it's going to take to get these communities back, back on track that the government's going to be there helping us? You're so right. It, uh, one rain event will not break this. Uh, I can tell. I used to be an ag banker. Uh, I can tell you it's going to take at least three or four just average years to get us back up on our feet. Uh, and one of the things we've said from the start, we get, we get castigated for going out and sitting and kicking the dust and trying to talk to people. Um, you know what? I say to everybody, Joel, the whole lot of us, get out there and listen and, and learn. Um, you know what? If you had all the answers, you, you wouldn't be out there. But we're going out and we're listening to them and that's why we continue to change our tact every time with a different, a different package to make sure it's targeted to you, to those that are most vulnerable. I need to, to bring in Joel Fitzgibbon here. Yeah, look, I don't want to have a blue of David on national television about drought, that's for sure, but that is just patently incorrect, David. 600 farming families have already been taken off farm household allowance because they've been on it too long. And by the department's own admission, another 500 families will be taken off farm household allowance by Christmas. Well, and I think that's a callous that. act uh, while this drought is ongoing. But can I just quickly Before say we move on, we just need to let the minister... No, no, the number's wrong. It's actually uh, 600 and there's another 1,100 that come off, but they will, they will still get a supplementary payment. So, We're so, not taking so the money no, out one, of your pocket. One off. No, no, no. One no, off payment. Joel, with due respect, you heard it. It's in Hansard. The Prime Minister made it clear that no-one... No one will come off these payments. We will continue to make the supplementary payments up until June next year and in May. In May next year, we'll have to make another decision if it hasn't so, rained. The Prime Minister said that in Hansard. You were sitting over heckling, but you heard it, mate. You heard it first. That is a misrepresentation, and you know, You know David. full well that the Prime Minister has that, been very clear that on that. That is a misrepresentation no one, and you know it no, is. No, it's not, Joel. And in fact, I'm, I'm, prepared, I'm prepared to make it quite clear right here tonight that this government will not be taking those off those supplementary payments. The Prime Minister's made it clear in Parliament. He's, he's in Hansard. He can't run away from it. Hey, 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 th th just think through the rationale of all the logic of this. 
Uh, they get a, a weekly or fortnightly payment. The, the Prime Minister's going to take them off the payment and then he's going to give them six months of payment in advance as a, as a cash payment on the way out. It's very easy for the Prime Minister to, to say, oh, don't worry, maybe next year we'll think about another cash payment. What is the logic or rationale behind that approach? It Let makes me bring no Payment sense Bride back in here. What do you make of this? Because we started the night talking about whether politicians had turned into this into a political stoush mm -hmm. instead of solving the problem. What's your reaction to the exchange you've just seen? I think we can see it right here. I mean, the question was about what, how, what's the future for the kids? And that's exactly my question as well. Like, as a young farmer, I'm 21 years old, where's my future in all this? I spoke to people um, just this week saying that they, there were people in their communities taking kids out of boarding school because they can't afford it anymore. That's destroying their future. But then also they get dragged back to a property where they can't even see a future themselves. Like, what are we doing for these kids? We are, like, you know, they're not going to be allowed to be in the cities. They come home, there's nothing for them there. I just, I don't understand. For kids, what are we doing? How are we helping these kids? People need hope and options, and I think that's what you're talking about. It can't just be one single thing, and I think people tend to focus on one single um, thing as if it will actually solve the drought, and the only thing that will solve the drought is rain. But in the meantime, we do have to have uh, all sorts of different measures out there to support communities, to support landholders, to support the kids and make them realise that they are feeling supported, that people do value who they are, people do value what they do, and that, the, and that we're going to make sure that we can see them through. Um, and also, we need to focus on, at the end of the day, recovery and making sure that when this is over, and we know it's going to be over, we need to make sure that there's support there then as well. So we have to get people through. That's absolutely our primary focus. And then, hopefully then, we can focus on recovery as well. There's a whole suite of things we need to do. Marie Knight. You asked the question about whether it's time to stop the political games. Are you seeing that? Most, fam most farming families aren't on the household allowance. Uh, it's such a tiny part of the problem and it's far from the solution, yet that's what we're hearing about. The th I I th Let's take another question now. This question is a video question from Grant Howard in Cuttable in Queensland. Hello. My name's Grant Howard and I'm a, I'm a landholder and a coal miner in central Queensland. Given that the state governments are implementing emergency management adaption plans for climate change, when will the government acknowledge that the current spate of natural disasters are linked to anthropogenic climate change and, when, and address the root cause by stopping new thermal coal mines? David Lee. David Little Proud, you've had a range of different answers on the question of climate change and its impact on the drought. What is your view? Yeah, obviously man has made a contribution to it. I don't doubt that. And, and obviously we've got to do something about that, and we have. We've made international commitments and we'll continue to do that. Well, was it a and, mistake, and, and, can I ask, to say you weren't sure? Well, I was in the middle of a, a, a Sky interview that was interrupted by divisions uh, and didn't get to clearly articulate. It wasn't, wasn't the clearest answer I wanted to give, but I've, I've been on a, a pretty clear record from the start. In fact, I'll give you a perfect example, Hamish, is that my first ministerial council meetings of all the agricultural ministers, uh, we created a, a, a program where we get a coordinated approach towards climate adaptation. And in fact, only last Friday, it was ticked off and agreed to so that all the states and the Commonwealth are working together collaboratively. We're not, we're not overarching, we're not overreaching into each other's business, but we're actually working together mm -hmm. to make sure that our response to this is, is one of a coordinated <coughs> approach between state and federal governments. And also, it sort of goes beyond just that uh, and beyond our reduction of emissions. It goes to the stewardship of our land. Uh, and one of the things that most proud I am of being Ag Minister was to create a stewardship, biodiversity stewardship program to reward farmers for the stewardship of their land, not only for carbon abatement, but the improvement of their biodiversity. Does it make it difficult, though, to address those challenges when you have members of your own party that are sceptical about the impact of, that humans have on climate change? Uh, no, because I think our record's been quite clear. We've been quite consistent, even in, with respect to reductions of emissions. Uh, we, we're saying that we can continue to invest in making sure we get the balance right. You can invest uh, in cleaner coal technology, but you can also uh, continue to complement that. Uh, you can also complement that with renewables. And in fact, my own electorate, I have, I have a shire in my own electorate that wants to be the renewable capital. We've got a wind farm uh, that's about to be completely 
completed. Uh, we've got a significant solar projects going on. Uh, so th th there is uh, there is commitments. You back yourselves with the smarts of the, the 21st century to make sure we meet our international commitments. We do it sensibly so that people can afford to turn the lights on and, the, more importantly, our farmers turn the pumps on. Let me bring Marianne Slattery in here. We've already heard attempts to sort of separate the issue of water from drought. Do you think you can deal with drought uh, separately to climate change or do you think water, drought, climate all need to be brought together into one policy suite to actually have any impact here? Well, given that drought by definition is the absence of water, I find it very <coughs> difficult to see how we can be talking about drought without talking about water. You know, when we've... Um, when we talk about, you know, people not having feed, dry land farmers not having feed, they rely on irrigated, that, on irrigated fodder in those years or shipping in fodder from somewhere else where it's not in drought. So I think that when we're in drought, our water policy and, and how we're using our water becomes very acute. Um, and, and the question is, at the moment, in the southern basin, we're putting a, a heap of water down towards almonds that are foreign-owned, um, that aren't even in full production. And we're doing that at the expense of growing fodder, growing rice and keeping our dairy stock alive. You know, our dairy industry is about to collapse. We're selling our dairy cows that have probably got 100 years worth of genetics into China and they're taking the young cows and we're getting an ageing herd. Um, you know, we're selling off our genetic stock of beef and of sheep. So it's, it's much more about... Um, ..much more about... Um, you know, how to help people. Do we want to, to have these genetic stocks there to survive? Do we want to have a dairy industry and a rice industry? And I think we should be asking those questions. Well, Fitzgibbon, this was a question about climate change and new coal mines. Uh, you seem to have a position on this that is quite different to other members of your party. You come from an electorate where there's a lot of mining. How do you respond to that question? Well, first of all, Holmes, it is true that the foundation for the development of any truly national drought policy has to be an acceptance that the climate is changing and we're all making a contribution. And in the coalition, there are too many sceptics or indeed deniers. But and you want Labor to lower uh, its carbon reduction targets. Let, let, me, let me finish. <laughs> David talked about what they are doing, but carbon emissions have been going up year on year, every year for the last five years. Um, and you can't avoid that, David, that is just a fact. What I said, Hamish, is that we can't afford to allow Scott Morrison's government to allow them to rise for another three years. Uh, so I, I posed the question, what could the Labor Party do from opposition, because unfortunately we don't get to run the government, what could we do to for over the next three years to force Scott Morrison into turning that around and, and to begin pushing emissions down over the course of the last next three years. I don't want to sit back for three years... Can, can we just be straight ..and talk about what we do in 2030 though, when he's just... allowing them to rise for another three years? Let's be straight, though, about what you want your party to do. You want them to reduce the emissions targets. I, I want my party to force Scott Morrison into acting over the course of the next three years, and I pose the question, what would Scott Morrison do if tomorrow we just said, OK, let's just go for 28% this time around? And if we were able to get to 28% by 2030 without costing jobs, without hurting the economy, that would be a great foundation upon which to argue for something more ambitious. But the alternative is just to sit back, have a target, feel good about ourselves, but allow Scott Morrison to allow emissions to rise every year for the next three years. I think that would be irresponsible of us. Do you think that's quite a confused political position? No, not at all, because they're going up every year, I want, the, I want to get them going down every year. We cannot afford to wait three more years. So We've you had do that by lowering your party's emissions reduction targets? I'm saying that Scott, all the focus would be on Scott Morrison if we just got out of the way and said, OK, let's focus on your target for the next three years and if we could achieve that turnaround and indeed get to, you know, towards 28% over that period of time, it would be a great foundation to say to people, see that? That wasn't that hard. We didn't lose any jobs. The economy's still strong. How about we do something more ambitious on the next round. OK. We've had the dairy industry raised a moment ago, so the next uh, question is a video from Natalie Akers from Talagarupa in Victoria. Northern Victoria produces 80% of the milk in the basin, but we are at a tipping point. The MDBA's own analysis shows that Northern Victoria has lost 5,000 jobs. That's 2,000 more jobs than any other state. 
the Commonwealth has obtained 25% of water that was once available to farmers. Quite simply, the Basin Plan is creating a man-made drought. How can Minister Littleproud claim the Basin Plan's created more certainty for dairy? I do want to come to you, Minister, but Mary Ann Slattery, does that check out? Does that assertion that she makes checks out? Um, uh, certainly dairy's industry is on its knees and it's, it's got very little time um, left. I but can you really argue that the Basin Plan has created man-made drought? I think that the water reforms, that includes the water market as well as the Basin Plan, have um, made things worse. I think that governments have exacerbated this drought. Um, there... Is there any evidence of that, though? Yeah, we've had increased extractions in the Northern Basin with um, the increase of floodplain harvesting through unregulated, unmeasured um, floodplain harvesting. Um, we've got new structures that have been subsidised by the Commonwealth. But there hasn't been floodplain harvesting for several years now. Can I, I, mean, can I finish, please? Yeah, sure. We had, um, uh, we've got changes to the Bowen Darling Water Sharing Plan, which, um, which allow take, um, take of, of all of the water in the river at low flows. The government drained Menindee Lakes in 2016-17 and has never been able to give an explanation of why they drained the lakes when there was flooding in South Australia. We've got the construction of big new dams in the Murrumbidgee, which capture and designed to capture flows that naturally would come out um, of the Murrumbidgee and support and undermine, underwrite the reliability of water licences in the Murray. And last year we saw the flooding of the Balmamilla Forest <coughs> for operational reasons to push water down for almonds in, at the end of the, the system that's, that otherwise could have been used to grow fodder for dairy and, and cows last David Littleproud, that's quite a list. Yeah, it's a long list, but let me make this clear. Uh, particularly going back to the premise of the question, uh, before I became Water Minister 18 months ago, all that was happening was a lot of yelling and screaming. And I can tell you that we weren't going to lock into that plan. We could have ended up with a lot worse plan uh, for producers in particular. Uh, what the plan does is says that you take 20% of the consumptive pool off farmers and put it into the environment. We have completed 80% of that plan. The last 20% can be done without going near a farmer. If the states decide to do uh, the, the constraints projects, the last piece to, to invest in the infrastructure and the smarts of today then we will not need to go near a farmer. We can complete this plan and we can get the hell out of their life. And I have seen, uh, personally, in my own electorate, the devastation to these people, not just the farmers, but the local community. When you talk about drought, it's also what's happened to those small businesses, many of which I've seen, that was their superannuation. And when the buybacks came, uh, it decimated those towns and, and someone who'd who worked for 40 years in a business, and that was their superannuation, was gone because no one else lived there. That, that is something I could not do. And what we can do is not go near buybacks again. Those things destroy these communities. And what I get, I'm as popular as the pox in places, but I cannot look people in the eye. I cannot look <laughs> people in the eye and say, I'm going to leave you a legacy that's worse than that's there now, because I can tell you, I know the people that have been hurt in my electorate and I can't look them in the eye and say I haven't done the right thing by them and their children and the next generation. It is, it is painful, but we can do this without going near a farmer again and we can make sure that we continue to work with our, with our states and the MDBA to, to get this right in the operational management of it. There's rules there that they follow, but they can always do better, and that's why we invest also with them with science to give them the tools to be able to understand. If better. I may, Minister, you look quite emotional. Well, these people, I mean, before I came into politics, I was, I was a banker out in St George. These, these are people I know uh, personally. But are they telling you you're making mistakes? No. Because we are hearing it all over the place. It's str strange that you're not hearing it. Because, you know what, those people, they want government out of their lives. And they see for the first time since this thing started, before I was even in politics, they see for the first time they can, they can have government out of their lives and they can get on and do what they do best, which is grow food and fibre. Can you say that to the people of Menindee, though? I mean, you look at the people in the Lower Darling, but also from, like, down below Burke. We've got a 1,400-kilometre stretch right now of river that is bone dry. We are having the lowest ever inflows into Menindee Lakes, and that's not just because of drought, because we've seen report after report point the finger at mismanagement and over-extraction. And so how can you say to those people, and myself included, that live along there, we're not going to put any more water back in the river from buybacks. You guys just have to sit at the end of the river and die. But that's what you're telling us right now.
And I can tell you the same emotional story in Queensland where you can walk across those rivers at the moment, those riverbeds, and you won't even get mud on your boots. There is a supply issue, a significant supply issue. And when you talk about that event that happened in, in Menindee and, and that horrific fish death event, make no mistake, uh, the reality was the, the water managers had to make a decision whether they use that water because it, it uh, is the least efficient because of this thing called evaporation and it evaporates quickly. So they had to make a decision what they use with it. It's a natural <laughs> lake system. Evaporation so what occurs. they had to do was did they, do they leave that water evaporate or do they get an environmental outcome out of it? And you know what the environmental outcome they got out of it? The biggest spawning event of Murray Cod in our nation's history from that water that was let go. That doesn't, that does not for any way make up for the, for the fish death that happened. But let me tell you, and let me say, fish deaths aren't new. I grew up on the Condamine River. I've seen Of that scale, over, they are. You know, we've seen over 600 of them in the last 30 years in New South Wales. And I've got to say... Why it, did it go? It went we, overseas. We, like, we, this was, like, it went worldwide. We had people from, like, just last week, I had more people come out from Germany. This isn't normal. Like, that is the biggest issue. We've got government trying to normalise what is going on, that the darling should go dry and that fish should die. That should not happen. I'm and not... yet, at the same time, when all that was occurring, I went up into Queensland and I saw huge amounts of cotton. Huge no, amount. Right. It is right. I've got footage of it. Uh, so, let me, let me make it clear. The environment and communities have to come before things like that. That needs to be the way it's done. And, and, and let me make it clear that the MDBA, is, is just, they don't own the water. They, they are the, just the water managers and send it down on behalf of state governments who have, who have uh, arrangements between them that have gone back generations uh, with irrigators and also the environment. And basically the MDBA sits down every year and says, this is the pool of water we've got. This is what your allocation gets out of your entitlement. And in fact, the, the Commonwealth water holder is treated the same way as an irrigator, the same way with the states. The states have set arrangements uh, between South Australia, Victoria, New South Wales in particular. And a lot of the, lot of the management of, of the river system comes from the responsibility of delivering that water. Because since Federation, we haven't been able to have the states agree. And that's been one of the biggest challenges. And, and Hamish, can I come in there? Because I think it's important. I mean, the, the, the question was asking about you know, 20, losing 20% 20 of their entitlement. That is what's actually happened through a lot of these communities because uh, over the, the since 2012, we've actually given back 2,000 gigalitres, over 2,000 gigalitres, that's, that's four Sydney harbours every year if the rain is there. That's gone back to the environment. That's water that's been removed from agriculture and is now the, the environment is actually benefiting. Now, we don't see that water. Are you saying that's a mistake? No, no, it's not at all. But that is why we're seeing some of the hurt in some of these communities. That is why we're seeing so much, so much um, stress and angst because it's actually removing water from one industry, from, from agriculture, from, from growing food and fibre, and it's actually contributing it to the environment. But what's, what's actually compounding it is because there's no actual water coming into the system, then in actual fact you just can't, you can't see the water anywhere and that's the hardest thing for, to actually to see. Do you believe that the way Australia is managing the water that it does have is working currently? I think we're actually work the the Murray Darling Basin plan to me is a plan to actually talk together to bring science into the debate to bring data and facts into the debate to but to do on, much that's better a straightforward question you What's know the answer? so is the, it working it's working much better than every man for himself and everybody for themselves which is what we have had since federation so since federation the states have been doing okay, their we, own we've thing heard, the people have been doing point. their own thing so sure. the, the plan though Hamish is actually the first time and it's going to take some time to sort out now in the meantime what's happened is because of course, it's, it's involved massive restructures. I mean, we have to do better. Of course we can do better. We must do better. But we're not going to do better unless we commit to staying in the room, talking to each other, feeding in the data as we get it, making better decisions, uh, being transparent about those and, and looking at what's important. Let me bring Marianne Slattery in. We're Be not patient, give it time. We're, no, it's a, the Basin Plan is a train wreck. We are not going to be... <laughs> We're not going to get better while we keep sitting here and pitching the environment against irrigators and, and allowing um, these really big, really big problems in implementation to continue without being honest about them. Um, I'm sorry, Minister, that your explanation of what happened at Menindee Lakes is just not true. There was only about 10% of the water that was released from Menindee Lakes that went to environmental flows. There was water released and so, you know, the Minister's correct in saying you've got this interjurisdictional, you know, complexity. 
and Murray-Darling Basin Authority is responsible for making releases on the lakes under certain conditions, but very importantly, under a certain set of rules. They um, made those releases from Menindee Lakes when South Australia was in flood. That is well outside their rules. There is no precedent for them to be making releases when the South Australia, South Australia was in, in flood. Um, at the time, and they have never explained that. You've never explained that. Noel Blair has never explained that. Um, and, um, you know, that has caused a, a shortage of water last year that could have been used, could have freed up water from the New South Wales Murray and they could have grown fodder. So the exacerbation of everyone's woes in the basin because there isn't enough feed has been uh, directly contributed to by the release of you know, it was 1,800 gigalitres of water from an Indy at the end of 2016 and 17, and no one has has owned up as to why that or why that happened. Minister. Well, as Marianne knows full well, there's there's legal proceedings on a couple of those matters that she touches. So I, I've got to be, I, I can't go in. But you just said that something you said wasn't wasn't. No, 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 no. Well, uh, I'm sorry. I represent the Australian taxpayer, uh, and obviously I've got to protect as a as a member of the executive. I can't previously go and talk about matters that are before the court. I don't think anyone would expect that, nor anyone that rep represents a company to do that. Um, obviously, with respect to Menindi, the incident there, uh, we, we engage Professor Vitesi uh, to come in and to give his expert advice about what we should do. There are a suite of measures, uh, more than $80 million plus package that we put in place. That is securing uh, some of the A-class licences that New South, Wales, New South Wales government's put in place. Uh, that's around giving better science, $20 million to make sure that we equip our water managers with the science, the best science to understand the environment, the changing environment, and then also around using satellite technology and remote river sensors to ensure those flows go to where they should be. And that's what, and that's what we'll continue to do. Make that investment as we need to, and and be agile enough to do it as as and when we need to. Our next question tonight is a video from Badger Bates in Wilcannia in New South Wales. Hello, my name is Badger Bates. Uh, I was reared up on the Barker, or the Darling River was behind me. In the old Barker, when I was in its glory, we got fish, yabbies, turtles. Shrimps, you name it, we got out of the river and it's fed us. And also, I like to add, we had fresh, beautiful water. It might have been muddy, but it was beautiful. And now the question is to David Littleproud, when are you going to put water and give us a guarantee that the barker will flow again? Minister Littleproud. Well, the first thing is that it has to rain. Um, we have a serious supply issue. I'm sorry. Um, I can't make it rain and the only thing that'll get the water running into those rivers is stuff from the sky. That is a serious, serious issue that we've got and until we fix the supply, um, there are going to be constraints on that. I, I'm sorry, I can't lie to you. Will when you the, when, ensure, when, though, when it does, well, like, rain, that that water is embargoed by the states so that water can actually get down to places like Wilcannia? I mean, I know Badger. I've been out to Wilcannia. I know the people out there. The male life expectancy of that town is 37. So that, How are we not fixing those issues? Well, and, and that's exactly why we work with, with the states who, who are developing and finalising their resource plans around the rules to fit within to make sure that the appropriate flows go to the environment uh, and they manage that with MDBA and we make sure that, that that's done and, in fact, there's been some trials done in New South Wales and a number of catchments around that uh, to get the environmental flows and that's why we couple that with the, the technology, the satellites and remote river sensing to make sure it gets to where it should. Uh, and obviously there's also an issue there that there was a flow from the Warrego, as you well attest to. Uh, we've, we've given the New South Wales government considerable financial resources to fix that and I've written to the Environment Minister in New South Wales to make sure he does fix that because if, if uh, heaven forbid, we do get a rainfall, uh, we, want that, that we want that water to flow and we want it to do it properly. And, and so I've got to engage with the states to make sure they come with me. Um, I, in a lot of this, all I've got is a checkbook to entice them and I've got one and I'm trying to get them to do it and particularly that embankment there, which was, you know, I've flown over it not long ago. I mean, it's disappointing that that should have been done long time ago. Let's, let's be honest, we can't gild the lily. It should have been done a long time ago. They should have just got on with the job. Uh, and I get this, there were some cultural issues, but really it's about going out and engaging 
with those people and understanding the money's there for it to be done. I'm not even asking them to put their hand in their pocket. I'm saying let's just do it because that was the contract that we signed and it should be it should be respected. Kay McBride, you've been out there in those communities. How much are they suffering? Our townships are dying. Like they have, and it's not just recently as well. I'm, my nearest town's Menindi. In my lifetime, that has halved in population. We used to have great big grapevines and used to drive in and like either side, um, you know, one company I believe did a million boxes of Menindi seedless. Everyone knew what Menindi seedless grapes were. They're not there anymore. The whole township is dying and that's not just because of drought, it's because of water issues, because the water just isn't getting down to where it used to get to. Um, and all our irrigators are gone, there's no more fresh fruit. And, you know, what's that doing to the rest of the town? We have to go another 200 kilometres to go and get any fruit. On a human level, what's that like? It's heartbreaking. Like, that's, that's where I was born and brought up. Like, it's my home and now there's nothing there. Like, you know, you can't... You can hardly go into the shops to get the things you need. It's, it's gone. Our towns have been destroyed and, and this is, was being destroyed well before this drought hit and that's what's really heartbreaking to see is that this is so much to do with water management and we're not allowing those townships and we always speak about, you know, we can't hurt the townships up the top and everything like that, but what about the people at the bottom of the river? Because we are giving them absolutely nothing right now. I want to find out a little bit about how this is impacting Indigenous communities as well in those areas. Bruce Shillingsworth is in the audience tonight. Uh, Bruce, I know you've been travelling uh, to those areas as well. Can you describe the impact? Look, we just come back from the big Yamaganabaka Karavri on the rivers, Walgut, Bree, Burke, Volcano, Minini. And look, I took a group of... Um, there was, a, there was a, a convoy of 300 people. And on the rivers, we had about 1,000 in the Karavri each night. Um, those Indigenous people that come on that journey spoke to a lot of our elders in those communities and they wanted to hear from the voices of those communities, those voiceless, that have been voiceless over the last couple of years, look, the impact of the water mismanagement and the corruption and the corporate greed and capitalism in this country has killed our rivers. They have killed our communities. Look, we've been out in those communities. Our, the health is deteriorating in our communities. Our old people are now dying. Our young people with a high rate of, of mental health, suicides, dialysis. People that are on dialysis can't get water to flush their machines. So they've got to move on, now migrate to bigger towns, bigger real towns and cities. So a lot of the First Nation people are leaving their tribal, their lands that they've been, you know, that they lived on for, for their thousands and thousands of years. How do we bring back the 50-year-old cods? How do we bring back the freshwater mussels? How do we bring back the aquatic life, the ecosystem and the animals that relied on the river and the water? They are now completely dead. They're extinct. This has happened over the last 100 years. Australia needs to wake up. I'm listening tonight. We're listening to... There's two things that I can hear. It's water and profit. Why are we selling water to make profit? That's what I'm hearing. And here, my people on the river that relied on those animals for the food source for thousands of years are now dying. This is the second wave of genocide that's happening in my community. So I'm going to speak on my community and I'm going to raise a voice for those that have been voiceless over the last 230 years. That's what frustrates me and that's what's frustrating our community. Why are our people are dying young? Why are our people are suffering? Because of the greed, the taking of our water. Where is our rights to water? First Nation rights to water. We have a right to fresh water. Put the water back in the river, not just for us, but for the environment. Thank you very much, Bruce Shelton. <laughs> You're watching Q&A across Australia. Our next question tonight is from Ben Horn. Yes, thank you. First of all, one comment following Bruce's comment. Uh, Fiona, I've heard you speak tonight a lot about the water and the area in Gyro, which is dry and everywhere else. And I've heard you, Minister Little Proud, talk about getting really emotional about being in the northern part of the basin where it's dry. What I haven't heard, and we didn't see you in Tokemore, where there was about 4,000 people that are hurting 
who was standing next to the Murray River, which is flowing over its banks, which has water, and the people down there, like in West Corrigan, can't access it and are being told they can't access this water going past them. How is that acceptable to you? And how in this country can we sit here and you as people in the government and representatives through National Farmers sit there and actually sit back and let this happen without having some sort of say or standing up and actually doing something about it? Fiona Simpson. Yeah, look, um, I think the one thing that would be worse than not having any water is actually watching it flow past your back gate. So, look, absolutely, I can feel your pain, um, not literally, but I, I, can, I, I, I totally think it would be the worst thing in the world. So my heart goes out to you and your community. I think it would be extraordinarily difficult. But however... However, Hamish, um, look, look, I think these are the things that we have to make sure we can address. The agreement that we have at the moment to work together, to work together across the whole basin, so that's the north, the south, the whole parts of the basin, it's incredibly different all up and down the basin. We have to understand and the plan is about making sure it's not a set and forget type of instrument, it's about making sure that we can understand the impacts, bring in the data and the science and what's happening there on the ground and, you know, and understand things like like the effect that the, the environmental waterings are having. Have, 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 what about the impact on the communities? What about the impact on the food and fibre growing industry? What impact is that having? And how can we do it better? And unless we have the agreement to all stay at the table working together on this, then we go back to, I think, you know, the last 100 years, which has been water wars, and where are we at? We're at where we are now. So we absolutely, we have a system in place now that we have to keep tweaking and fixing. We have agreements about, you know, um, the importance of, of, of uh, water for agriculture, water for communities, about impacts. We're, we're actually measuring now some of the impacts on the communities. And we have to feed that in and give people confidence that it's not going to be like this in the future, that so, we so actually have a better way. Ben's original question was about confidence in that system and I'd yeah. like to take that question, please. Thank you, Hamish. So my, my question is... It's my understanding when you become a politician, this is particularly addressed to Minister Littleproud, um, you need to disclose all sorts of things such as citizenship and financial interests. So why is it that politicians do not need to disclose if they or any related entities such as in-laws control or own water entitlements or licences? Minister. <laughs> um, Sadly, Bruce, I'm not married any longer. Um, my, my marriage broke down some time ago. Uh, my my in-laws, my father-in-law and mother-in-law were dry, li dry land wheat and sheep growers. They were not irrigators. Uh, and sadly, uh, we get a lot of people that hide behind the curtain of Twitter and Facebook, uh, get on a keyboard and say a lot of things that aren't right. Quite hurtful. Uh, you know what? Have the courage to come forward and put your name to it. I've put in place an Inspector General that will bring integrity. If you are so confident, go and ring McKilty and raise any allegations you have with him. I find it uh, quite distasteful that you would raise something that has no foundation, that's predicated by someone that's too weak to come out from behind Twitter and tear away at my family that sadly has had um, a, a breakup. Uh, but, look, if that floats your boat, mate, good luck to you. Minister, question... can I just ask you, though, about the issue rather than the personal component, which I'm not entirely clear on, but should, should people in politics have to declare an interest totally. in this sort of thing? Totally. Um, so so no why, why don't they? Well, um, what's in question, what he's trying to raise from, from behind Twitter is that someone has tried to say <laughs> that my ex-wife's second cousin once removed, uh, who now facing charges over, over the misuse of a Queensland state government uh, program somehow w has a link to me. It was created before I was in Parliament uh, and before I was Water Minister. So, you want to dance? Let's put it out on the table. Let's go, and, let's go hand in hand to Mick Kilty. But you know what? Let's be mature. I want to lead the nation. I want to make sure that we get this right. Uh, but if we want to get into this petty, grubby situation, Good luck to you. And I think we should say that, Ben, you're a, you're a lawyer involved in a class action at the moment. I think it's best yes, if we leave the personal bit out of this. But it, it is a reasonable question, isn't it? Why shouldn't politicians declare And this they should. Stuff? And I have nothing to declare. But um, with all due respect, my ex-wife's second cousin once removed 
Um, I don't know how many of your partners, second cousins, ones from you, you talked to. I never met them. <laughs> <laughs> there, is your, there is your answer, Ben, with all due respect. All right. Uh, let's move on now to our next question tonight. Uh, and it comes from L Laura McFarland. Um, what is being done to aid farmers in keeping their property? The National Far Farmers Federation and Barnaby Joy should not be saying that it is time for farmers to make tough de decisions. It is time for the government to stand behind the people that are struggling and stop making empty promises and playing the blame game. Why not declare a national disaster to release more funding and extra resources for help? Can I put that to you, Joel Fitzgibbon? Yeah, well, thanks for the question. I thought it was a really unfortunate time for Barnaby Joyce to be suggesting that people would just be forced off the land to be paid uh, to exit. Now, there will be farmers that even in better times will be marginal at best for various reasons, many of them outside their control, but you can't start uh, saying people aren't viable because they're still hanging on in the seventh or eighth year of drought. Now, there might be a time in the future when we talk about assisting people to leave the land if they don't have a long-term future, but in the middle of the drought is absolutely the wrong time. And it's another example of the ad hoc approach the government has to this drought. We, again, we don't have a, an overarching national plan. And back on bipartisanship... But this was a question, though, about declaring a natural disaster. Would you in government do that right now? Well, we certainly are in a national emergency, but, but I think the government's going to have to spend more money than it would spend if it invoked the national disaster funding. So it's a moot point, really, how, how you derive the money. The fact is that we are potentially, God forbid, facing a calamity here. I think a lot of people are underestimating how serious this drought is and there will be some tough decisions needed to be made, a lot more money to be spent. And this is why Anthony Albanese and I have reached out to the Prime Minister and said, look, let's form some sort of drought cabinet, whatever you want to call it, an advisory body, so the major parties and indeed other, other representatives in the Parliament are sitting together and, and reaching a consensus on these things. If you've thought so much about this, what's the figure? How much does the government need to spend? Well, unfortunately, the Prime Minister was claiming for many months that he was spending $7 billion, and that was uh, proven to be untrue during Senate estimates uh, last week. At very best, if I want to be generous, he might be spending... This is a question billion. about you. What's the figure that you... Well, well, well Hamish, I'm in opposition, and yeah. sadly will be for another three years almost. But what we're saying is... Anthony Albanese stood at the Bush Summit in Dubbo and wrote a blank cheque. He looked down out to the audience, including the Prime Minister, and said, Scott Morrison, the opposition will back you. Whatever you want to spend, we will back you. A blank cheque from an opposition leader, that's pretty rare. I don't know whether his shadow treasurer thought about it at the time, but we, are, we have supported every measure the government has put forward over the past six years. Oh. The problem is there's you been try. no strategic... I know what you're going to say, Minister, and you are wrong. Uh, there has been no... Uh, <laughs> you just the rest of us in. Because... Uh, uh, <laughs> overarching strategic plan. No, no, as I said, no, no scenarios about what it looks like in the future, no responses to each. And I'm sorry, I, I know you didn't mean it offensively, um, Madam President, I, I like to call I her. I hope not. But, but it, this is... We had a, a process for developing a national drought plan in 2012. COAG had a plan. For the first time, we dispensed with all the old exceptional circumstances arrangements because they were full of moral hazard, inefficiencies, they were expensive and there was no proof that they were working. So the states and the Commonwealth, with the support of the National Farmers Federation, said, let's start again. Six foundational points to develop a, a, a truly national drought plan. What happened? Tony Abbott was elected. He and Barnaby Joyce abolished the COAG committee that had been charged with progressing that new plan. And all we've had since is these piecemeal ad hoc decisions, almost on a weekly basis uh, lately, it, because the Prime Minister just yeah. thinks it's going to rain I one think, day and he kicks it down the road. I it's think what's ridiculous. tended to happen is it's rained. Every time we've decided that we're going to have a national, you know, a national approach and a national drought strategy, it's rained. But I think the premise of the question, going back to the question, um, the question is, is that the communities need support now. And there's a whole range of different things that need to happen out there. And that's why when we've proposed a package for the government to consider, we put forward things that were going to affect all sorts of, uh, of different um, people, no matter what they do in the community. So we've talked 
talked about, for example, local government rate relief. We think that people, that there are a lot of people that aren't accessing much support at the moment. So we want to make sure that anything that government puts out there is actually going to help the most number of people that we possibly can. Now, we have suggested as part of that, we've suggested local government rate relief, we've suggested how they could maybe keep employees on farm because we know that if people leave farms, they're unlikely to come back. They're part of the rural fire service, the rural fire brigade, they're part of the school committees. We need to keep people on the farms and in the communities. So we've put forward some suggestions around that as well. ICPA, back to our friend at Trundle here. You know, how can we keep people, and I think Kate raised, you know, how, how can people keep sending their kids away to school if they li live a long way away from school? We think they need some help to do that. And we also do think that the sad, you know, it, it's our, our main aim is to try and keep people on farms and to keep them sustainable and, and make sure that they're there for the future. But we also think that we need to have as part of the conversation the fact that some people have had enough and they should not be stigmatised for thinking that they need to leave the land. They don't want to do it again. They just have had enough. And so for that reason, we have proposed that the government consider uh, offering exit packages. And we think that that is an option when you're Did in you know drought. How many people are going to sign up? Have you heard from your... Well, members? we know that in the, last, in the last time it was offered under John Howard, about 138 people took up that option. But this time, how many have you heard from that are actually willing There's to There's plenty, plenty of commentary on social media at the moment. Well, and people we who've all know come that means me. not much. Well, no, people <laughs> who've, who've, de who've, who've messaged me and said... So there are people who, even though the property market is strong and, um, you know, that, that people think you should be able to sell your farm, for, for all sorts of different reasons, some people are feeling like they have no options, Hamish, and that is a horrible, horrible way to feel. If you feel like you've got no hope and no options and the only thing you want to do is to move out, then, you know, and I think it isn't a huge amount of people, I think it's a relatively small amount of people, but by the same token, you shouldn't be stigmatising people who, who feel like that and if they, you know, it's about giving people hope and options. Do you think they and want to move out, though? Because the feeling that I've got from so many people is that we feel so abandoned by government, we have no hope, we cannot stay any longer, and this might be the only option. No one, I, I tried to find someone this week saying, Would you leave land? Do you want to? So, not a single person. We do farming because we love it. It's not a job, it's a lifestyle. We live there, it's our life, it's our, you know, you wake up and you go to bed after night time. Like, that's, totally agree. People totally don't want agree. to go. No, no, totally agree, but it depends on your age and your stage and where you're at and what's happening. So, there are plenty of people, so this drought's come hot on the heels of, of the last drought, and I don't think it is a lot of people. I honestly don't think it's a lot of people, but I also think people, you know, you want so to try the and relieve the stress. So are the packages distracting from the real issues then? Um, I think it's just part of a whole suite of different things that we should be looking at if we're being honest about what's happening out there. It's not, you know, we know that one size doesn't fit all. We know that not one thing is going to help everybody. Um, but in actual fact, you know, I think we believe, you know, we have a plan for a $100 billion industry by 2030. There's a lot of things envisaged in that. Clearly we, we think that we're sustainable and strong, but we also think that this drought is absolutely, hopefully, a one in a lifetime and it's having impacts on people in so many different ways. And at the moment, we need to support people but put a whole range of different things on the table. Well, that leads us very nicely to our last question tonight. It's from Simon Toskin. I'm 17 years old and my family are farmers from Darlington Point. In the next few months, I have to make some very important decisions that will impact my life. Is the government able to let us know if they have any options and plans that will help future-proof farming and provide viable and exciting career options for young farmers? David Littleproud. Well, definitely. And look, can I encourage you to go, uh, go home, get into agriculture any way you can. But let me say, one of the things that we will be uh, bringing out in the very near future is agri-starter loans through the Regional Investment Corporation. And we've asked our Regional Investment Corporation to partner with banks because one of the biggest inhibitors of getting young people on the farm gate is capital. And how do we work with uh, traditional banks to partner with them to, to use uh, the $2 billion we've got sitting in the Regional Investment Corporation to use to get young people into agriculture at the farm gate level? Uh, that's going to be uh, a product that we're trying to make sure that it has buy-in from the commercial entity so that we can partner, not compete, and then transition into the commercial world. But also we need to think about the new jobs of agriculture. And not everyone can afford to go back. And one of the things that I did as Agriculture Minister was around research and development. We should have a, a centre of excellence here in this country on research and development. We've, we are ranked number 20 in the world 
Uh, US and Netherlands are sixth and fourth in the world, and we've got more researchers. So how do we get better bang for buck and get into the new jobs of ag tech, into science and innovation, to give our farmers the tools they need uh, to be able to adapt to a changing climate? They're the new jobs, not just the traditional pick and shovel jobs, but the new exciting technology jobs as well that will complement them, that gives a career pathway, and not just in the cities. What we wanted to do was make sure this was uh, these uh, R&D centres were put across regional Australia. So we actually went and did the research and development in regional Australia and then that makes it easier for the extension work for farmers to see it and touch and feel it. So the future is bright. And this is the thing is we... Mr. Let me just down. go back to Simon and ask him whether you've excited him sufficiently to head back to <laughs> northwest of Wagga. Oh, uh, yeah, I guess, but... <laughs> <laughs> Kate, what would you say to him? Is there a bright, promising future on the land? There are a lot of good things about ag and I think, you know, for me, like I'm a fifth generation farmer, it's in my blood, I could never leave. Um, but right now I don't see a future. With where, I, where we are, um, water management the way it is, I just don't see a future and I think the only thing that would let me see a future is if we got a federal royal commission yeah. and got to the bottom of what's going on. That is the only thing. Water management. Absolutely. Yeah. In terms of water, get a federal royal commission, look into the Murray Darling Basin plan, what's gone wrong, what we can do better, and how we're all going to move forward. Because that affects so many farmers. It affects all people along the Darling River, also um, you know, our dairy farmers along the Murray as well. We need to get to the bottom of what's gone wrong and give people a future. Well, we've thrashed out a lot of the issues tonight. Not all of them, I'm sure. That's all we have time for tonight. Would you please thank our panel? Marianne Slattery, David Littleproud, Kate McBride, Fiona Simpson and Joel Fitz. It's good. You can continue the discussion on Facebook and Twitter, I'm sure you will. Next week, in collaboration with the Wheeler Centre, an all-female panel, Fran Kelly, will be in control alongside the Egyptian-American author, Mona el Tahawi, Indigenous writer and activist, Nyuka Gori, the anti-ageism author, Ashton Applewhite, and Jess Hill, whose forensic investigation of male violence is challenging old assumptions. Thanks to all of you that contributed questions to tonight's Drought Special. I'm sorry that we didn't get to all of you, but we're so grateful to you for contributing and to the many of you in the audience in the studio tonight for driving such enormous distances, please give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> That's it for me and the team here at Q&A tonight. A very good night.